practice that is experimenting uh, what will come next to the future of, of architecture and urban. So um, he's coming from a background of industrial design, but his expertise is to smell the technologies, <laughs> to, um, uh, to try to bring them, land them into different projects of different scales. Um, and to try to enhance the products and the projects that the office is uh, offering to the different clients um, as, as, as kind of, of uh, you know, like a novel pilot projects. So um, he's very much into the computational design processes, into cognitive uh, uh, design workflows from the very early stage design processes, which is something that is very, very interesting, especially when we are uh, focusing on, on developing ideas that could break the standards, no, or that will kind of question stereotypes. And I think this is what we are doing uh, here at IAC every day, every night as well. And, and um, I'm pretty sure that Kovus will contribute into that. Uh, thank you, Kovus, for joining us for the talk today. Thank you for joining us and become a contributor to our forthcoming uh, IAC Beats. Uh, journal, which is based on, on um, the notions of artificial intelligence and urban design and planning. I think this new relationship among um, uh, designers, codes, machines uh, uh, is, is something that Kobus will be talking about today. And, and it's something that we are all interested to see how we can uh, work with that, not as the goal, but as a medium for um, much more uh, inclusive, sustainable, and, and human-centered environments. So uh, thank you, Kovus, for joining us. And yeah, please help me welcome Kovus, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Reti. Uh, this is, uh, it's really great being out here. This is my first time in Barcelona. Uh, I like the weather. I'm from Cape Town originally. It's similar weather. Um, I call Cape Town the sort of a uh, southern tip uh, Mediterranean area, but it's not quite, <laughs> but, but we're there. And thank you for Omicron for us picking it up, by the way. <laughs> we, we didn't uh, start it, we picked it up. So, um, so I'm a, I'm a Kubis Botma. I'm in the London office. Uh, I'm applied director, applied research director of Conf Peters and Fox. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about virtualizing architecture. Um, I'm going to touch base on a whole bunch of concepts. Uh, the idea is to try and tell you, or try and tell you from my perspective at least, where the future of architecture is going. Um, now I'm speaking to a group of people here that are pushing the boundaries of materials and fabrication and design and computation. Um, but I'll try and give you a perspective from our side, uh, from the industry side, about how we're trying to engage this. Um, so I'm not going to talk about uh, virtual architecture. If I can get it to change, give me one second. I'm not going to talk to you about virtual architecture. It's going to include virtual architecture, but it's not the topic. So. So I'm in the London office, I'm in Covent Garden, that's the entrance to our office, um, we're about 150 people in London, um, as I already said, we're about 7, 750 people globally, I'll get to that in a second. Um, we're quite known for tall buildings, um, this is uh, two of the buildings, China Resources and one Vanderbilt, that is recently opened in New York as well, um, but we get to do really amazing spaces and amazing buildings at various scale. Here, Hudson Yards in New York and uh, Lime Street in London that you guys must, must recognize. Um, but many of you may not know that we do really intimate spaces as well, like Floral Court. Uh, we've done the master plan for Covent Garden, uh, and this is one of those breakout places that created that has really been applauded uh, for the quality of space and the interconnectivity of people. Um, for the last few years, we've been focusing on the reuse of buildings. This is the old BT headquarters uh, where we've taken the facade and recycled it and made the building fit for purpose uh, as such. Uh, 105 Victoria Street. Uh, this is important to note here for two aspects. Uh, we're aiming to be zero carbon in this building. But the second thing as well, this is one of those projects where New York and London was designed together, right? So this is a very important aspect about our company. We don't do everything from one particular office. Uh, and if you look at some of the closer details of that, uh, you'll need to understand where I'm going to with this, with this presentation. 
uh, the fact that we need to understand and, and, and experience our designs. Uh, here another project, I'll show you a little bit of examples as well in Bermondsey, uplifting a neighborhood. I think there's about eight buildings here. Um, we're doing some refitting. This is the old biscuit factory that we're refitting and adding residential on top of that. And with this project as well, we have gone ahead and done some uh, static VR uh, at a couple of years back uh, to get public participation, to explain to them how we're going to uplift it and get it out to more people, um, which is kind of a, a, a part of what I'm going to be talking about a little bit. How, how can we how can we get that get that uh, design and design process to, to more people? Um, so where are we right now at KPF? Um, this is a bit of a timeline of the last 20, 20 21 years uh, of what we've been busy with. And I've, I'm, I'm blocking it only from 2000 onwards. Um, the building on the bottom left there, the computational geometry building was one of the first projects to use generative components from Bentley, for those of you who remember generative components. Um, important note, and I'm not gonna go through it sequentially, but an important note is around 2003, we opened all our offices to become one global office. So while we are located in nine different locations in the world, we run our practice as one big practice and we have multiple offices sometimes contributing to one design. And that is an important aspect from a globalization point of view and from a distribution or democratization of technology point of view. Um, I joined in 2008, uh, I joined KPF uh, and uh, I was involved in design and, and multi-projects. I'll show you quickly uh, one of them. Um, and in 2012, uh, 2013, I kind of formally started the applied research effort. Uh, I also need to notice, note you in around 2010, we disbanded our big visualization and computation groups that many practices still have. Uh, our philosophy is that we enable the architect. And this is another underlying uh, uh, point that I'm trying to do in this, this lecture here is how we enable architects to use technology in a better method. Uh, we don't want an architect to be purely a design and go to someone and have to wait for a day or two or a week, whatever, to compute something to come back with an answer. Uh, I have a, a affiliation for, for visualization. So I've been involved in many of the uh, technologies on visualization regarding VR and AR and computational visualization as well, uh, real-time ray tracing, streaming, and the likes. Um, but again, here you can see that we are introducing user-level VR, user-level AR, uh, and animation. So we actually have our designers that have a click of a button or a process to go from the design tool into a visual aspect. This is not something new, but this is something we're really pushing hard uh, uh, at KPF. The KPF technology, advanced technology efforts have six uh, spheres as such. Uh, I sit in the applied research side. Uh, I interface with all of them, uh, like the others interface with each other as well. Um, but I'm a quite a small group, and I'm very much involved with pushing the technologies in, in these multi-assets. Um, infrastructure and operations, for example, we're busy testing a multi-GPU server to be able to do certain functions for us. I need them to help me build that. We have a digital practice team uh, that really enables the future-looking uh, applications uh, to the users. They kind of huddle the user as such, if I may call it that. Uh, data science, that's where Alex sits, for example, uh, where we do machine learning and AI-related work. Uh, and then we have uh, environmental performance and urban interface. They are the two large sort of analytical uh, hubs uh, that do the work um, that I'll show a little bit about as well today, both environmental as well as urban interface, uh, urban analytics. So when I joined KPF, this was the project I worked on. I worked on this project for roughly six years, uh, broken up. Um, the first three years, my job was to design all the furniture and fixtures inside the building. Uh, all the disks uh, and all the processes, as well as curate and manage the complete 3D data set that went out as a BIM model at the end of the day. Uh, I took a break for a year or two during Tender, where I did a couple of other projects. Uh, and then I led the computational, uh, let's call it deciphering or decrypting for the fabricators, uh, where we deconstructed the computational processes behind this building uh, for the fabricators to be able to build it. Just to give you the indication of scale, uh, the building is from the one point to the other point is across, one mile across. Uh, the facade in the front there, total extension is about 70 meters. Um, and we work in up to millimeter accuracy, uh, in particular with that roof, which is a 400 by 400 meter roof suspended 50 meters uh, in the air. 
So it was quite quite intense those days. It's a really amazing project. I hope they open it soon. I think with the pandemic, everything's been on, on slowdown. So just a little bit more about where we're working, and this is where we are now. Uh, I've been a little bit involved in this project. Believe it or not, this is a student housing project um, in London. Uh, this is uh, part of the digital practice effort with computation and visualization and fabrication, where we're looking at the component-based uh, fabrication and how to uh, apply that to a building facade uh, through various scripts. Uh, and then also working with a contractor now on how we can offsite fabricate this using their systems and how to adjust our BIM models to fit with those systems, both from a construction or structural point of view to a component point of view to a linear element point of view, uh, where we start looking at um, uh, the notion of a, a platform-based construction as such. Uh, and in this, in this case, this is another project where we define typical floor plan typologies with facade matching typologies. Uh, and those then can be uh, optimized down the stream to people that actually are gonna go make it, right? Platform-based construction is an interesting concept. Um, uh, and hopefully that'll also help with the environmental point uh, where we can get more industries involved, not just the construction industries involved to make us component for buildings and to be able to reuse those uh, components in, in fabrication. And then, in the trend of this talk as well, how do we get that data out to people that don't use the BIM applications or the, or the, or the modeling applications through simple interfaces? And this is partially where our data science team is involved as well, uh, pushing this out to apps to be able to get it across. Environmental performance is very important. Um, we are zero carbon committed. We've signed up to the agreements. Um, and this is a very important aspect for us. So there's quite a bit of work going around that. Um, and, um, you know, we have this quantitative and qualitative approach to it with the carbon footprint, resilience and ecology, well-being, and the community impact. Um, we also use or our approach to this is through passive design, smart design, the reuse and transformation, as I showed you, the Bermondi project as well, and material innovation. But more importantly, we use tools and uh, the, our designers do not know how to use these tools. These tools are on the hand of very few in our office. And I think the important aspect is, is how do we get these tools to more people? Um, and how do we get them to be able to use these tools like the shoebox design tool for a facade component? Uh, so a designer can adjust parameters himself or herself and immediately understand the impact of the change of the parameters. Here it is again, uh, daylight and glare as an internal study. So typically a designer will be designing, they'll go, we need to do analysis on daylight and glare. I'd like to know the answer now, but I cannot. Uh, we need to go and contact the people that do this. It takes two days, they come back. Now they lost the whole train of thread, right? How do we progress this? This is some of the urban analytics that we do as well. This is how we study uh, uh, the impact of our buildings, uh, the visibility of our buildings. Uh, what can be seen and not seen, the dialed factors around our buildings, et cetera. In some of these cases, we set these up as generative models and do a brute force compute uh, and allow people to go and play with the results coming out of that. Uh, both the parameters on the one side, as well as the results coming in the other side, uh, these two sides uh, to, to the actual generative model. Uh, and in some cases, like sidewalk, in the Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto, we build a manual interface for the public to go and actually turn, turn the dials and say we want less density and more parks, but is that the result that you want of it or do we want to change that? Of course, with the, with the pandemic as well, we've moved quite heavily into VR and AR. Uh, on the left-hand side, they see a client in a coffee shop in Boston approving a design. He was sitting in Boston having coffee with one of our principals. Uh, and on the right-hand side there, you see us having collaborative sessions on a project in China. Um, also trying to get this to a point of, um, of uh, sharing. This is a quick uh, model that we made up for a virtual meeting room for a project specific uh, with myself and someone from New York testing it before uh, any of the meetings and so forth happen. Videos, drawings, uh, and, and all the other sort of functions uh, is what we're trying to do. So you're trying to mimic almost what you would do in a physical space, have a model on the table, uh, and trying to build a rapport around that. And then there's lastly on fabrication as well. Uh, we let our users use these machines themselves, our architects. In most cases, they go to a model shop. We have a model shop, but in many cases now they can actually print themselves and we can print from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world. We make sure that our printers are enabled and networked. 
Uh, and we've done some of this even with uh, robotic printing with the guys from um, AI Built, where the computer is actually happening on the cloud uh, and uh, downloaded to the robotic arm to do printing. Uh, so this is a little catch up of where we are right now. And most of these technologies are technologies I have a drive in or a part of, uh, and of course, work with those six uh, main teams to try and understand it and push it. But it also shows the notion of anywhere business and anywhere business is uh, something that Gardner mentioned. Um, and it's becoming quite important. Uh, the architectural and construction industry is very isolated from the rest of the world. Um, and probably hence, well, probably why there's a slow adoption of many technologies. Um, you guys know that we go out on social media or use any of your other functions out there, things happen very quickly and autonomous in the background. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to do is, is kind of break that open. Uh, I've mentioned we have had this, we have nine offices across the world, and we basically had up to recent, now that we're getting back into the office, about seven, 750 remote offices, right? And how can we get designers to be more human in their design and not be people that have to understand software, to understand where to click a button, to deal with a mouse and a keyboard uh, and the likes. And this is kind of where we we be sliding, moving towards is, is augmenting our designers to be better designers, right? And to be more human in the aspect of design. We have people that don't know how to use software just because they never had to learn how to use software that are incredible designers. We have incredible designers that do know how to use software. And then we have people that are very good in software but may not be really good designers, right? And the idea is to bring these guys together in one, one kind of space. And this is not new. Uh, this is uh, uh, Engelbert in 1962 already spoke about the augmentation of the human. Uh, and this is an important aspect. This is something that is coming, right? Um, uh, we don't need to know how to code or build everything. I often do the analogy of a pencil or a guitar. We can adapt our guitar or we can tweak our guitars, but we don't need to be a guitar builder to be a good musician. Right, and if we have multiple musicians together on the table, we can create amazing music. So how do we move forward? How do we go forward with that? Uh, in 2018, we did a talk quickly, uh, myself and a couple of colleagues, um, trying to understand a two bedroom apartment, uh, giving every space a uh, characteristic and the likeliness of the space adjacent to it. Um, and what we were trying to understand there as well is how we can use a generative process, a human activating a generative process, a machine learning algorithm running in the background, and an immersive feedback to the human again. So the humans involved in a certain aspect of this design, uh, the initial trigger of the generative process, or, or the whole process of generating this compute, uh, but then very much into the feedback loop of it. Uh, and right now, our focus is on how can we close that cycle to be more real-time as such. Um, with that specific uh, test case that we did, um, we generated floor plans, we generated connectivity uh, diagrams of, of these. And this is a two-bedroom apartment. You may say, why a two-bedroom apartment? Well, we had a specific case around it uh, for multi-use multi, multi -use of the rooms. Um, but we also had a, a semi-automated visual feedback to it, where we could place these winning apartments, the ones that we giving the best quality uh, and have the designer look at the data, the metrics, and also jump into that space at the same time, right? And that was the kind of start of this human machine, human interaction that we are, we are progressing with now. So um, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, many of the computing terms that are floating around in the industry at the moment. Um, some of the ones I noted here, uh, like no code, I mean, 5G is gonna have a big impact in our business. You guys have all heard of, of course, the metaverse and meta and the related. Um, but there's a couple other ones, composable design, uh, biocomputing is already part of that. Uh, ambient computing is really part of our lives already. Um, but I'm really looking forward to how the applications like ambient computing can become part of what we do, uh, meaning that we use high level compute and compute functions without actually knowing it. Right? And meaning that us as human can be more intuitive and more be comfortable with compute because we don't even know that we are using it. So this, this is leading to this process of democratizing compute. And this is how to get more designers onto compute. I'll get to, I'll get to nice images soon, I promise. 
There's a couple of diagrams first. So this is currently how we set up as a global practice across the world. Um, we have the client side uh, sitting on the top layer there. This is the designers. The designers interface with their machines and data is uploaded to our public or private cloud. What we are doing now is we're building geometry compute servers and visualization compute servers all sitting away from the user. So what we are looking at is have the user compute visual and geometry functions, not on their actual platform, not on their desktop, but actually be able to run a compute function of an iPhone for that matter, because the compute doesn't happen on the device, it happens in the cloud, right? This is a, a process forward where they can continue to use the typical softwares that we use uh, in multi-interfaces, um, but they are free from the compute. This is part of necessity because we cannot, at the moment, control the hardware that everybody has. Um, you know, of course, we have DAS systems and a whole bunch of other cloud-based systems, but we cannot always control the, the, the device that the user has in front of him or her to be able to design. So we are, are building these interfaces to push it out. And that moves it to the process where we had in 2018, where we look at the designer doing a design function. Uh, the design function, it calls a task uh, as such, uh, that, that has a library of tasks, and that task is, those tasks are very agnostic, they're not specific from any software, um, where the compute happens and the visual feedback comes back immediately. So instead of a brute, for, brute force process where there's a thousand or five thousand iterations, the designer can immediately get that feedback uh, and continue with the design and iterate the design or that process of design until they are happy with that. Now, this layer of design compute functions is where we, we try and develop at the moment um, and, and try to expand that. Uh, and then, of course, when you start doing that through a design process, we have multiple stages and multiple functions and so forth. You now have a large library of compute functions. Uh, and we kind of refer to this as the application layer and the experience layer. So the designer is, is working with a very intuitive front end, and I'll get to that in a sec, uh, and, uh, but they have the ability to call any function that's out there on the cloud available to them, whether it's from one of our software partners or something we developed ourselves to do that specific task that they want and get the immediate feedback to, to, to make a decision where they are, no matter where in the world. So this is the typical precursor to this, where it's a brute force process. We do multiple iterations and then we use a clustering method to pick the best performing ones. And we also make these tools available to users through our intranet they can go download, download these tools and use them. But still, in this case, the user have to have an understanding. They have to have an understanding of Dynamo or Grasshopper or some related script. Um, we want to get beyond that, right? And we want to get beyond that to, to give the user a simple interface so that every designer in our office can run a daylight analysis. We don't have to show them how to use a Grasshopper script. We don't have to show them where to connect, how to load, or any of those functions. They will open a dialog box, and this is happening right now, and select what they want to do and run the compute and get the immediate answer. There's no delay, there's no calling someone to go and help them or anything like that. And we're expanding that now through this process um, through multiple interfaces, uh, which is where it's getting more, more and more important. Um, the in-app application, as I said there, whether it's a Revit or a Rhino or, or something like that, we will have the interface there um, and they will be able to run a cloud compute from inside the application itself. Uh, we're building this now for our Scout application, which is the web application. So again, instead of doing a brute com uh, compute, uh, whoever is running a presentation or interfacing with uh, Scout can query it immediately, get a compute function and get the answer back immediately. Right? And that is very important when you're in an intense env uh, design environment. It's, it's quite critical. We're looking at real-time applications as well, how to give that visual feedback. And then, of course, we're looking at something that I'm focusing on quite a bit, which is mixed reality, um, where the differentiation between physical and digital becomes a kind of a blur. And this is really where we start finding the emotive side of design coming across, um, where, where it's quite intuitive. So when we talk about design experience, when we start talking about this emotive side of things, now this is really where we're trying to get designers to be natural in a natural environment, be that with physical or uh, models or with physical spaces, uh, and overlay that with digital information so seamless that they cannot tell the difference and they can understand and make effects and changes immediately and see the impact of that immediately, be that geometry or analytical uh, in nature. And this is a, a kind of work in progress way of how we approaching it. 
Um, we look at the various aspects of design or that, that affects design, geometry and visualization, analysis, uh, spatial and social data, and the simulation of these together uh, to, to get this experience layer going. Um, and that happens through these design compute functions. So we want to be able to, to allow a designer to run a building model in real time and adjust the building model in real time, uh, like this live street proof of concept that I've done in an environment that they couldn't do before, right? This is a, a ray traced model of about 40 square kilometers of London. I cannot load this in Rhino. I, I battled to road, load this in 3ds Max, um, but we have Rhino models. We have about 80 3ds Max models, and we have three uh, high definition BIM models all included in this. And this model is real time and it's visual feedback, but it's also real time and it's geometry feedback and it's compute feedback, uh, which means that if I adjust something on this model, I will see it happen in real time. So when we look at some of these, I'm not gonna cover all of them. Some of these aspects, when we look at geometry, uh, this is a case where we run that to the visualization model, uh, where you can see here that we have a, actually two Revit models and a Rhino Grasshopper model. Uh, where the visual feedback is automatically in the visualization application running a path tracer, not a, a, a rasterized type of visualization. Um, and we can adjust the geometry in the authoring application uh, in real time to affect that. Uh, of course, it also allows us to load these models uh, uh, and visualize these models and experience these models from a, uh, from a human perspective. Uh, and we'll get to some more interfaces on that pretty soon, uh, where we can walk the streets or, or adjust it here um, as you can see with uh, with uh, daylight factors and, and reflectivity 100% correct. And again, these models are live, the geometry is live, the, the rendering is live, the lighting is live, and the analysis is running live here on these models. When we get to visualization, again, this is one bundle belt. This is a BIM model. Uh, those facades are all in 3D. And we have part of New York model here loaded as well. But a designer can very easily understand the visual quality of the facade. Here, a project in China with the same aspect. Uh, this is a Rhino model with Grasshopper linked to it, as well as Revit components. The geometry is all live linked, and the visualization is all live linked as a feedback. Right? And uh, here, the Bermondsey model made up of uh, level two building uh, BIM, uh, sorry, level two BIM building models. There's three of them, which makes up about eight Revit models, as well as Rhino models and 3ds Max models. This is not pre-computed. Pre this is running real time that's been captured. Uh, and again, the geometry is also real time. So we're getting to a point now where a designer can look at a visual like this on screen and add more building to it, uh, run analysis, and see it in the real space that they're seeing it as you see it on the screen here. Um, it's kind of a new place in the world, uh, this whole real time compute and real time ray tracing. Um, and we're trying to see where we're going to be able to extend this uh, in, into the future. Now, I'm going to get to an area that I like a lot, which is analysis, um, and in particular, the, the, the heavy computer analysis side of things. Um, this, again, is showing us streaming radiation, facade radiation, to, to a real-time model uh, from a grasshopper script. Um, when we look at CFD, and this is one of the areas I, I'm going to Talk a little bit about now. Um, this is typically what we have as a comeback, uh, you know, vector arrows, data and metrics uh, relating to the wind. This is one crown place in London. Um, we are accelerating this and building interfaces for our users to be able to get to this point within about half an hour. Uh, at the moment, the CFD compute runs six to eight hours. Um, this is a cloud-based CFD system that we're building a front end for the users to be able to use. So CFD is typically something that the user or an architect do not get involved with. They request it, and it's a couple of days before they get a response. We have this now down to about half an hour, uh, where the architects will soon have a tool to be able to run CFD themselves. Um, but of course, we can push that further as well, where this is a live feed of the CFD computed model, not a, a live CFD compute, but a post process of the computed model. Um, in this case, We've used a VDK file, a computed file, um, and streamed that from Paraview into a visual model. Uh, and that visual model can have a whole bunch of other models and compute happening at the same time uh, that allow us to get the bigger picture 
running across this. So we do this proof of concept with one cron place. Um, this is the, uh, the BIM model with the CFD analysis run over it. Um, this is typically not done in this manner. Um, but a little while ago, about a year and a half, two ago, one of my colleagues was also looking at this and she was saying that uh, she wants to look at accelerating this. So we also built, instead of a brute force compute, a, a machine learning compute on CFD. This is about early 2019, 2020, I think, that, uh, that it came across. So the idea was really to pre-train a machine learning algorithm uh, with uh, multiple, I think we used a few hundred uh, uh, um, uh, CFD cases on this, uh, and allowing designers then to pick the height, the wind orientation, uh, as well as the typical geometry. Right, And we got this down to a couple of seconds right now. Uh, and as you can see in the next model here, that's just me capturing one of those cases uh, where I adjust the geometry, I adjust the inputs from Grasshopper, and I get the visual feedback on the, on the BIM model, on the Revit model itself. Um, this, is where, this is one of those cases uh, that I referred to earlier, where we're looking at this immediate iterative response. This is, uh, this is a, uh, um, a predictive CFD, so we're not gonna hold anybody to it but it's gonna give the designers that immediate response in terms of how they need to orientate and adjust the buildings to be able to, uh, to, be able to, to, to get the best solution at the early stages of the design. And of course, what we do is we combine it with the compute of CFD as well. Um, so now we have a iterative design with a brute force compute sitting on top of each other. And it does allow users to go into more detail. This is a live feed of the CFD. This is something they would not have picked up uh, probably if they hadn't looked at it in more detail, uh, this is a case where they can see where the wind is causing a downdraft and the pedestrian comfort may not be really amazing there. Um, and uh, look at these as if they are wind tunnel models, um, but they are digital wind tunnel models. Uh, and uh, with the added advantage, of course, is that they can look at it from any position and they can change the analysis typology or type from any, any point uh, to show what they want to show. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, further analysis that we do as well, this is actually a project in Madrid. Um, we looked at office layouts. We looked at the uh, dispersion of people when they come out of the lifts. We look at different uh, functions within the office as well, the sort of more um, movable spaces versus the static spaces and how we can break those spaces apart um, as a study to get to the best solutions for this office uh, in this project. Um, and then we also, of course, stream that down to a digital model. So now we can adjust the parameters on the visual aspect of it and actually have an understanding of what that space looks like as a model, but also what that space looks like as a, um, as a, as a office space itself. And I'll get, to, I'll get to how we experience this a bit more in the future. The video wasn't showing, so. And so this is a recording, of course, of the real-time model. Um, and uh, our challenge is how can we get to understand the densities of these both from an analytical point of view, as well as from a visual feedback point of view. And then we get to, to social data regarding the design experience itself. Um, this is what we call city fingerprints. This is a early stage study on this. Um, we've taken Covent Garden as our first case, uh, and we're trying to understand the spatial quality uh, uh, and how people interact with the, the, the the area that we are studying. Um, this came about because we had a project where we're trying to study the uh, redirection of pedestrians, uh, which is very difficult to do. Uh, and in many cases, the redirection of pedestrians is down to painting angel wings against the wall, um, and you get people to walk in different spaces. But what we did here was taking social data and understanding what attracted people, what got people to walk down those little alleys that are usually not walked down to, how to activate those spaces. And then how can we take that fingerprint and apply it somewhere else? How can we take something from Brick Lane in London, for example, and apply it to Mayfair, which is a complete opposite of Brick Lane? Um, how can we apply uh, um, this to a South Bank area, for example, a Covent Garden to South Bank area? And all deals down to the clustering of this information and the application of that, uh, that information for the user. So the user can actually now have a fingerprint or understanding of what that part of the city is about without having to experience that part of the city because they're seeing it through the eyes of the, of the public, the people that are actually experiencing it. And what we're gonna be doing this in the future as well is taking those fingerprints 
against our proposals and trying to understand the, the correlation or the rapport between those two design studies, the actual real life one and the one that we are proposing for that, uh, for that project itself. And then lastly, regarding the simulation side of this, how can we take all these aspects, give the user a intuitive tool and get them to experience that? Um, that's me on the left before I, uh, I changed. This is an application we looked at a while ago. Um, these are four colleagues of mine, part of this uh, uh, VR application. This is done in 2018, I think it was. Um, we'll be running uh, high-end models across the world, some of people in New York and some of the people in London here. Um, but we also allowed people that did not want to go into VR space, this application also allowed them to join from external spaces. So here's one of our designers in London office with me and a colleague in New York uh, inside the meeting room, and he's sitting in a physical meeting room calling in like we do with Zoom uh, these days uh, as such. Um, and I can I could adjust where I want him to be and what I want him to look at. And if he didn't want to join me in the in the space itself, he didn't have to. So we're getting to the point of of multi interfaces, uh, a tablet, a PC, VR, and AR, and how we can actually push that into into more practice, into into the use of of, of future. We did a lot of work with Hololens in the past. Um, we've done visual mockups. We CEOs of companies have approved it. Uh, I believe AR is one of those applications where it's going to find the easiest adoption in the commercial field. And if it gets commercial, it becomes part of our field as well. This is the, the chapter living model uh, that I showed you earlier. Um, that it's a one-to-one -one, uh, facade model for the designers to review. Um, and uh, the reason the reason I'm saying AR in particular is that we find that VR, including with pass-through cameras or not, is still something that most of the senior people do not want to engage with. So we're looking at the HoloLens type applications, we're looking at the NREALs, the Mega Le Magic Leaps and, and the likes out there, where people can engage with each other and, and see what they're doing. And uh, it, it does become something that is, becomes more and more useful. Here we have a physical model uh, with a digital model that the, that the guys didn't have to go make because we're using digital and physical overlay. Now, this is an early stage experiment uh, that we were working on a few years back. Um, but this is the kind of process where we're looking at going towards uh, with design and computation and analysis of laying this with the physical and the digital in a, quite a tight-knit tight uh, uh, scenario. Um, here they were simply looking at a change in the lobby space and the stair location uh, and how to interact with those two. This is a little while ago, so the quality is not quite, quite there. Um, so what we've done recently, if you step back a little bit to what my talk was talking about, the ability to adjust geometry analysis in real time, this is running off an iPad. This is a big BIM model, a really big BIM model of that one project. This is running off an iPad with ray tracing, uh, where the designer can adjust the geometry and the lighting in real time because it is streamed right? and streaming is quite a big deal uh, as you can see here with with this ray trace uh, streaming is a big deal so we are streaming basically a model of a multi gpu server uh, that is linked to the design applications and as the designers adjust the design applications with a very intuitive either headset or a tablet the person that's going to go review that don't have to try and look at it on the screen and trying to figure out how to rotate it they simply walk around the model Right. They simply walk around the model as if it's a physical model, or they walk around the model at one-to-one -one scale as if it's a built model. Uh, and this is reflecting uh, true materials, true lighting, uh, and the likes. Right. Um, here we're doing the same with a, uh, um, a CFD model. This is an AR model streamed. So this is running off a lightweight device like an iPad or an iPhone. Um, streaming to the device, again, with the environmental specialist being able to sit there and adjust the preview or the function of the CFD and live update to the AR model. Right. So this becomes an extension of, of presentation. Now for most cases where decisions are being made, there's usually somebody that understands a 3D application because somebody has to go and rotate and move things around. Now you're starting to work with, with more intuitive interfaces where a designer in this project, for example, can go and walk around that and become almost one-to-one -one in a physical space with that model. 
right? This is again streaming the analysis model to an AR device. So this, this is a startup where we're going with this physical digital merge um, and it's putting analysis data in top of that and it's putting compute data and visualization data on top of that running off remote machines. For those who want to know how this runs in the background, I'll do one slide on that. Um, uh, we basically have remote file server and we have remote, if I can get uh, my mouse up there, um, we have remote compute service here. The user actually in this case was running off a virtual PC, so they didn't even have to have a PC, they could run off an iPad. Um, they were sending an instruction to run a compute as well as to our data science workstation to do uh, compute on that. And that was streaming back to a GPU server that then streamed it to a lightweight device. So there's quite a bit of compute happening away from the user. As a matter of fact, the user had a very lightweight laptop in this case, and that was all that they had, and they could do the full loop of, of, of what I showed you. And hopefully where we're heading towards in the future with this is if you take the block models away with physical models, is to be able to put our buildings in space where they're going to be built, to have pedestrian analysis running there so we understand the density of the buildings, to have daylight and other factors running, to have CFD running, and then to be able to adjust these things on the fly in the physical space in one-to-one on-site, -one on right? This is going to happen. Uh, it's just a matter of time. I think a lot of it has to do with headset development at this moment. Uh, 5G is out there. We can stream this. Um, I was supposed to yesterday uh, attend a factory where they're already doing this in the factory space, uh, streaming high compute models to the factory floors for people to understand it. But more importantly, if a designer was looking at this building and wanted to change the facade terracotta tile right there or change the column or the opening because they see that the wind is changing there, we want them to be able to do it there live on site when they experience it. And what we're proposing now as a step even beyond that is if you look at the previous model, is to start putting robotics in space, uh, start training robotics in space, start training edge computing in space, uh, start for this uh, project to start being trained with the future technologies that it'll be using to maintain and operate it. So our initial design model that was a life link to a visualization model now becomes a training model for the implementation of delivery robots or the drones or whatever else might be used in that space. So that is my stage one. There's a couple of slides I want to quickly talk about, which is next stage. Um, I don't know if there's any questions in the meantime. I think we can probably do it after this. Um, the, the notion of, of our, our designers being able to use intuitive interfaces, pencils and pens and hands uh, and eyes to design um, is becoming more apparent uh, and, and, and more clear. And we are enabling that right now with pushing our compute, not heavy compute through simple interfaces away from the designers to be able to run as a background process. Now, where, where is the future going? And this will be a bit of a difference because I had fun the other night quickly making these slides. Commercial AR and XR is coming. It's already there. Uh, it's going to grow. It's going to become part of how we work. Uh, we are going to have glasses in our offices, in our meeting rooms pretty soon uh, that people are going to put up and they are going to hook up and share uh, uh, anchors, spatial anchors, so everybody can look at the same thing and interact with the same data. And then we are going to stream high compute would be that analysis or geometry functions visually through these glasses for everybody to experience that. That, that is happening as, as a next stage. Smart contracts and NFTs, are we gonna start uh, exchanging uh, our drawings through, through NFT processes or the likes? Are we, is that the way you're going? Smart contracts definitely is happening. It is happening. Um, there's some really interesting work happening around that space. It's not just the exchange of design and design contracts and drawings as such, but also the use of our buildings that we're going to start integrating uh, smart contracts into. Another aspect that I'm quite um, close with is the aspect of neuroscience and city design, right? And this comes back again to what I've been spoke, speaking about earlier. Is can we get our communities, our public people that are going to be using our spaces to experience our spaces before we actually build it? And can we monitor and understand the effect of our spaces that they will have on, the, on them 
uh, before anybody has cast a stone uh, or done anything uh, uh, on that. And the important aspect about what I've said before as well, especially if you get out onto the site, if we stand on a site outside here, for example, and we have a proposal for a new master plan with new vegetation and green, uh, and we can pull in the analysis data that we're going to be seeing so we can actually see the wind, see the wind as smoke, see the wind as movement of air, not just streams, hear the cars behind us and feel the sun on our backs. We have physical and digital experiencing with our, our neural uh, consciousness. What is it going to make us as, as designers and as, as uh, future occupants of that space feel an effect? And how can we make the changes now before anybody goes and makes mistakes on site? Right? So it is really that physical uh, digital merge that's happening and how to fix the human. Open formats. I mentioned USD here because we've been working on that quite a bit. Uh, Jason, uh, a new take on IFC, whatever you want to call it. It's a hot topic at the moment in a couple of practices. Um, the notion that they, the data is controlled by the big software companies uh, and we have to connect to them. Uh, I think the future model is going to change where the data is open and agnostic and these companies will have to connect to the data. Um, USD is Pixar's format used for animations. It's now starting to be used quite heavily in the AAC industry, or there's a big look at it at least. Ambient ML and AI, virtual assistants, or what I call them, uh, not white collar robots, polonic robots. We are gonna have virtual assistants as designers, right? We are gonna have software designers working with us to say, you cannot put a staircase there, or the staircase needs to be in this orientation, or this needs to happen because it's coded in the book. And that's what the machine has been taught to help us with. So we are gonna get that. Is it scary? Partially. Do we need to do metrics in design? Do we need to understand the code? Of course, we do need to understand and know about it. But do we, do we need to apply it or do we need to apply what we as humans do best, right? Which is design and use our, our human skills in design with these soft robots as such, assisting us and guiding us and nudging us in the right, in the right direction. The metaverse, or as I say, at least our version of it, but this virtual and digital merge, that is going to happen as well. We are really looking and discussing on design of buildings, a space like this, for example, where my interpretation of this space will be different to Areta's interpretation or any of your interpretations, because you will have a different digital overlay of that space to make it custom to you. Right? This is moving forward and we are going that way. It's just a given. And lastly, the way we work, digital humans is another big, big topic of mine. Um, maybe in the future, I'll be standing here as a digital human and not a physical human. Uh, and I'll be presenting and looking like I look now, but I won't have to have to fly here. Um, but I will have that presence and that, that connectivity with you because you will see me as I am, or as I want you to see me at least, let's put it like that. So a little bit forward, human version one versus two, right? Uh, it's a scary concept. Um, this is coming, right? I'm just telling you guys, give it another 10 years or so. It is coming. Neural connectivity is already happening. and. Uh, we need to be aware of this. We need to be aware of, of what is happening. But I think the, the take back of this is, is that we as humans want to be sure that we can emote in our designs uh, and uh, experience our designs to the point where we can make the decisions along with compute uh, and uh, do what we do best as such uh, as, as human designers in the spaces we design. So I think with that, one forty-five minutes. So. There was a lot, I know there was a, a, a lot of topics, I understand that, but uh, I hope the notion went across to this uh, human machine interface and how we as designers are going to become, like we were in the past, more designers instead of technologists. There's two sides to it, I need to just say to this, there's those who are going to focus on design and those who are going to focus on design technology. We do need both, right? And design technology is critical to be able to build these interfaces and enable these interfaces or design on both sides of this year. So, so. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Kobus. I think that was like a, an amazing masterclass, not only of what comes <laughs> in the future in, in terms of uh, technologies or the potential of technology to uh, affect the design discipline, but more than anything, also how an office could be organized around these new technologies. No, I think I took a lot of a lot of. Um, 
pictures of your diagrams um, to, to have it as reference, but I think that was, that was a really interesting talk. I, I, in, in much of the work that we are doing here at IAC as well, we're trying to see how we can use technologies in order to create these interfaces, not only for the designers to be much more informed in terms of how we design, but also um, um, interfaces that would allow people to understand the design yeah. discipline, no? to communicate yeah. the, 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 the power of the design, to communicate the different variations uh, that design can bring into different spaces and therefore allow more stakeholders to participate in that process. So there is no doubt that the, mm. let's say, top-down traditional way of making uh, uh, architecture or design as, as a kind of a star architect is not valid or will not be valid in the close mm. future, but these more collaborative frameworks will open up um, into, uh, in, into our, our fruit current and future practices. No? So mm. that was really, really helpful. Um, um, There's an incredible amount of, of, of time waste um, and we are under more and more pressure to produce more and more with less people. I mean, we've done buildings with, with handfuls of people. We, you know, we, we, we put more people on it when we need to, um, but the time waste is usually, you know, if, if I always say to people, if, if our design leads go into a meeting room to discuss the design and they can get a nod from the client, it saves us three, four weeks, right? That's three, four weeks that we could have done a better design, change the design as such. And the drive is how can we get sort of this inclusiveness of the stakeholders, the senior partners, the juniors as well, which is very important to understand how design should progress and the public uh, to participate, right? to, to, to understand 100%, not look at something that they go, what do these numbers mean? You know, or I can actually almost feel what these numbers mean. That's, that, that's where we want to get to. Um, so the, the decision-making is immediate um, and that will allow us to do our designs better because it'll give us more time to design. We won't be chasing uh, functions the whole time. So. Time optimization. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, are there any questions for Kobus? Uh, hello, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have two questions actually. One of them is more related to the real world and the other one to the virtual one. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so when you were talking about uh, how to put also this kind of technology into urbanism, also with the like tracking social media and everything, you mentioned that sometimes it only takes like a wing drawing a wall to attract people to there, but that's quite ephemeral. So like I was uh, like, it can change all the time. Maybe it's something that will last for two months or so, and then we're gonna change. So how can also design be adaptive in this way? This is one of the questions. And the other one is like uh, looking at all of this, are we designers supposed also to look for virtual designing, like start designing buildings for the virtual reality as well? How, how this is gonna work in the future? Yeah, um, okay, so the first one is, is, is a tricky one um, because those things are usually quite spontaneous. Um, we are looking at how to, I mean, the, the Floral court, for example, is a classic example. Floral court that I showed you there, the little restaurant area with the trees and so forth, um, it was a private space. Uh, and we, we, there was no north-south connectivity through that whole area. And to get to the, to the market, they had to walk around. Um, so that's one of those areas where we created something kind of permanent, but it has restaurants that change, but it became a space. Um, uh, just next to it as well, there's a tunnel for you guys. I don't know if you've been there, a tunnel or walkway but it's all lit up with, with uh, sort of this reflective mirror. And everybody walks through there and you cannot walk through there because everybody's taking photographs there, right? But these, so these are two kind of, kind of almost opposing as such. You have the one which is a static uh, implementation that is so popular. And then you have this other space where you actually create a link between two areas by not just opening up the link, but creating something quite unique inside of it. Um, I think that's probably the way forward. The, the spontaneity about, about paintings and so forth is a tricky one. Um, and you want to create almost a, a, I think you almost spoke about it earlier, about the closing up of streets. You want to create this, uh, this uh, pop-up uh, effect almost in a way. Um, in London, there's a couple of areas that uses uh, 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 containers. 
are called box parks and they're quite popular because some of them you know you're going to go there you find the same person and some of them change quite a bit um, but you want to create these spaces that are quite unique that that, that has this sort of, sort of uh, connectivity aspect to it but also this changeability aspect to it and, and, and such then on the second one um not for virtual worlds uh, for augmented worlds for mixed worlds, worlds i think i think it's probably time now look many architects become become game designers and get into the movie side of things and so forth but if you see what's happening in the movie side as well now there's a physical aspect and there's a digital aspect and it's real time right it's it's we're shooting the movie and we go well we don't like the column over there can we quickly move it right and then move it in real time and they continue shooting uh, that's one aspect to it and that's what i'm kind of referring a little bit to here as well in some of the design aspects where we can have a compute interface and have a slider by using our hand and it can adjust the building or the facade of the building when we get to designing i think that's the next stage where it's going to be very interesting and i think uh, it's very much open to exploration um, where if i want to come here and i want to see a certain art installation on that because that's what i like or certain greenery i can see that you guys can't unless you download my uh, installation of this room uh, and I think that's an interesting space for architecture it's a very difficult one because architectures like to build things and go and stand and have things fixed um, but I think the augmentation of that is completely interesting um, and there's there's ways of doing it through glasses there's ways of doing it through projections and through media walls and so forth but I think it's a it's a very interesting space to to look at um, I'm, I'm I'm for sure very uh, interested beyond the just navigation beyond the just going down the street and seeing that you can turn left and right right uh, seeing uh, colors or animation or whatever you want to experience or if you want a calming effect uh, you know be that only noise or, or something else that you introduce into a space when you walk there um, you know so i talked a little bit a little bit about neuroscience and, and some of my interest there is the fact that we are identifying cities um, and uh, you know, I'm trying to think of how we can create buildings and spaces that will calm people and make them feel like they belong there, uh, while being more dense than ever before. Um, and that's a challenge. But I think, I think virtual design is, you know, with the NFTs and the metaverse and everything coming out there, we need to keep an eye on it. Uh, otherwise, there's going to be a startup company that's doing interesting virtual designs. Uh, when was it? Back in 2006. There was an island sold for $25,000 that was virtual. I think it was Second Life. Yeah, it's, it's happening right now. Big, big. <laughs> so. One question from, I have to keep my distance from the speaker, I guess. We have a question on Zoom from one of our online um, viewers, uh, Michael Grot. Thank you very much for the lecture. And um, he says that it seems like many of these technologies are being developed as bespoke solutions within larger offices. Are these mostly proprietary at the moment? Do you see a path for these technologies to be accessible for smaller offices, students, uh, etc.? Very, 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 very good question. Very good question. So I mentioned open source here a little bit. I mentioned open formats a little bit. Some of the stuff we do is proprietary to us. Um, but there's a big notion to working on open source data, open source information. Um, uh, currently, uh, there's a push to be outside of the big uh, software companies as such. If we just look at software uh, and work open, many of our practices are doing the same things, many of them. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about how do we get to a point of actually sharing this information. Uh, there's a couple of platforms that are that are trying to do that, Hyper and uh, Thornton City Swarm, uh, where you can upload a code or a script and distribute it for free or, or by buying as such. Um, but we see the open source area moving forward quite a bit. Um, but to answer you on terms of what I've showed you here, uh, none of this is custom developed. Most of what I showed you is off the shelf. Um, it's just connected in a way that we want to use it. I think that's the interesting part of it. Um, most of these technologies, the streaming technologies, you can stream now, uh, uh, you know, from game engines or other applications that are out there. Um, the real-time ray tracing applications, uh, the link with the analysis applications, uh, the compute, Rhino compute functions, those are all, all tools that's available. Um, it's about the connectivity and how to make use of those. I think that's becoming interesting. Um, we're trying to drive a next level above it because we're trying to introduce more technologies uh, that are used for other industries uh, into our industry uh, to make it more intuitive. Um, uh, and 
and yeah, but as as as, as a short, uh, none of these main technologies I showed you were 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 out. Oh, we didn't code them. We didn't develop them. Uh, we developed the process, you know, and we work. I need to also add that we work very close with large software companies and hardware companies um, at very early stages. And we do that to give them an idea of what they should be developing, which is very important. Um, you know, we've had this in the past where companies develop in one direction and the architects are going, we don't need that. We need that. Right. And then you have in some cases where somebody develops something and the architects go, I'm going to use this and nothing else because it works exactly like I want it to work. Um, we we involve with many of these aspects at quite high level um, uh, machine learning, visualization, computer, etc. Uh, to try and make sure that the tools that's coming out there for the broader industry uh, is along the lines. And we're not the only guys doing that um, along the lines of what we should be doing in the future. So we challenge them as well. Trust me, we, we challenge them. Thanks uh, so much for your uh, lecture and, and being so generous and sharing so many projects. Um, I have a question that has been uh, eating at me for, for some time and considering the premise that you made and the project that you showed, I figure I could ask you, um, which is related to uh, the ecological impact of this digital infrastructure. So um, you said that KPF is committed to sort of net zero or, or low impact um, strategies or, or design. Um, and I'm wondering if within the development of these digital interfaces or, or um, yeah, digital interfaces or, or design tools that you guys do, um, do you look at also the impact of, for example, the data centers or the, the infrastructure that's needed to power these? And um, in, in your response uh, to these conditions, you had uh, four axes. So are you also working on designing um, the physical infrastructure that is necessary to power these in line with the four responses that you indicated? Interesting question is a good question. So. Um... Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, our infrastructure and operations uh, bubble, I work quite close to them. Um, th th there's a lot of things that happen in the background to be able to run these, uh, to make these things work. Um, uh, one little thing, just, just a little note, um, all our nine offices, for example, are cyber secure certified, right? So we have a level of security that we can put on, on the table when we speak to clients. Um, that is one little thing that is quite a tricky thing to run. Uh, and for us to be able to stream some of this data and get some of this data out, in many cases, it's quite a difficult bridge to bridge. Um, but yeah, right now, as we speak, we have an eight GPU uh, EGX server, it's called, uh, in our London office that we are slicing up in multi-methods. Uh, currently, it's sitting as four single GPUs and one four GPU. Um, and the purpose for that is to be scalable to be able to expand it to eight single GPUs or one eight GPU machine as we need uh, to be able to stream the data and the geometry in the compute that we want to. That is not an easy thing to do. That's not something I'm gonna go and try and do. And I don't think most architects will try and do that. That relies on the proper infrastructure, the IT guys to go and figure that out. And that is a machine with multi GPUs for that data to come to my, my device here in Spain in real time requires the whole network infrastructure to, to happen. So yeah, we very much, very much focus on that. It kind of rely heavily on that um, uh, for a lot of these technologies to work. I, I can tell you that. Uh, we work a lot with the, the large cloud providers as well, quite closely. Um, we work also with uh, companies like in the NVIDIAs and so forth. We're looking at, uh, at uh, deployable spin-ups of uh, virtual servers when needed. And then the, the kill of the server, the drop of the server when we don't need it anymore. Um, I mean, as a matter of fact, currently many of our designers access an application called Frame, which is a DAS system, which, you know, the, so they can work uh, with a full suite of softwares in the cloud as they want to. Um, that's currently hosted on Amazon, um, but we are also doing projects with some of the other large providers uh, to, to get this across. Streaming, streaming definitely uh, is a big deal, and um, uh, you'll see a lot of that coming in, and that, that relies on us setting it up. Yeah, very much. So yeah, very, very important thing. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the technology side and I'm talking about designers and architectural technologists, but there's, there's another aspect to it as well, which is going to continue the, the, the actual computer scientists as well as the infrastructure people. Very important. That's why we have those six spheres uh, and they are very much part of it. And I work close with them. Yeah, very good question. Yeah. 
have a couple of more questions. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, could you please elaborate more on the topic of the integration of smart contracts and FTs into architecture and Ooh. what form could they take? Uh, I can't talk too much. As a matter of fact, my head of uh, IT in London, you should speak to him. He knows everything about it. <laughs> everything. We had a, um, I can point you to somebody that's very interesting. Uh, we had a, uh, we have with this once a year, we have these tech days or tech weeks at KPF across, the, across, across our offices. And uh, uh, this year, earlier this year, I had a professor from Edinburgh, Edinburgh University, uh, Professor Speed, uh, Chris Speed uh, speak. Um, and they did some interesting stuff in Netherlands with smart contracts uh, that you need to go and do certain functions, almost like geocaching in a way. And if you get there in time, you, you will get coins. And if you don't, you will lose coins, right? Um, also, it's been experimenting with the fact that you want to go to the movie and you'll auto exchange uh, information uh, about what the movie is going to be about and then accept to go ahead with the movie and it's an automatic kick in to go to the movie. Uh, you don't pay your rent, your, your lock goes on because your smart contract is going, because it's quite binary, right? It's, it's yes or no. You didn't pay your rent, your lock is on. That's not a good case, but that is where it can go. So um, I can't tell you too much more about it. The fact that I do play a little bit with it. Um, uh, I'm not, I don't have any NFTs out there. I can tell you that. Um, but I, I definitely keep, keep an eye on that space. Um, but uh, where I can see it probably going is the, not just the exchange of contracts, but the change of the management of the buildings. I think there's going to be a big part of that. Um, and there's probably going to be a part in ownership, how we might exchange ownership, because the, the whole blockchain principle is so clear, so cut dry in the fact that if you meet the, uh, the requirements, the deal exchanges, and it's coined and or minted, whatever the case might be, and it's passed on. Right? There's no, there's no vagueness. There's no gray. There's no uh, solicitor or arbiter that's feeling good that day or don't feel good that day. Right? And I think that's going to have a big thing. And, the, and then the implementation of that can go very viral and very global, um, where we don't use money anymore as much, and we just exchange. You know, I want some of your time. You're going to buy me three dinners. You know, whatever the case is, and it's done, uh, there's an exchange happened. I met your requirement, you met, met my requirement. It's an interesting case. I, I would definitely recommend you, you look up Professor Speed uh, from Edinburgh. He's done, uh, he's done a couple of really vibrant talks about this topic, and uh, you, can, you can find it on YouTube. It's very cool. Very cool. So, sorry, I can't say more about that, but. Um, thank you for any more questions from the room? We have a couple online, but. Presential has priority. Okay, I'm guessing that. No. Um, okay. Uh, well, Alexandra is asking um, if you can elaborate a little bit more on how you involve neuroscience and human experience as part of the tools that you use to analyze and design. Okay. Good one, that as well. We, we don't do any research in it as yet, uh, other than reading papers and understanding it. Um, uh, I follow uh, a particular uh, blog and, and uh, um, uh, um, we call it um, talks uh, by a neuroscientist on the effects of, of it. Uh, I want to exchange data with him as well. I have not done that yet. Um, but we want to get to a point when we talk about neuroscience is to not necessarily just understand what the neuroscience aspect of it is. I know that there's been some work done in, by UCL on it, um, but we want to get to the effect of understanding neuroscience and then the visual impact or the physical uh, emotional impact of design on the human from that aspect. Uh, more than that we haven't done, we need to get to the point of actually putting people in the space and seeing their reactions. Um, we, we have looked at doing cases where we monitor people within VR environments and so forth. Um, that was a while back and the, the issue with that is that it's too foreign, so the reaction is already an accelerated heart uh, an accelerated sense because they're in VR and in a foreign space. Um, my aim with this is in the future to get to a space where, where the user cannot tell if it's digital or physical, um, and then tell us what they feel about it and exchange. Take a building out, take a building in, do something else, uh, and try to understand what, what the effect of them is. But that will happen probably once we get to the other, other side of things, connect first. Uh, in the time being, we are talking to some people, but Neuroscience is quite a quite a topic. <laughs> that, so, yeah. Technology is also it also has to step up 
um, for us to be able to get more data on that in yeah. real time without having um, uncomfortable spaces to extract it. You know? yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I mean, the big, the big thing is always. I mean, and it's, it's a funny thing, and it's not, not, not hundred percent linked to this, but um, we do, we design many of our buildings are office buildings, and um, I've done many lobbies uh, in, in, in VR, and the, our very experienced designers that work with Grasshopper and Rhino and Max and V-rays and Inkscapes and all these things, I always watch their first impact when they actually see the lobby as a one-to-one -one experience. Now this is VR, right? Um, but time and time again, they are surprised about the scale, about the quality, about the light, about things like that, time and time again. Now I want to take that and put the physical inside of that uh, and then get to them to understand it and then have an, have an immediate change while they do that um, uh, to actually see if that affects them. So, so. Um, okay, uh, thanks. And we have one more question online uh, by Dina. She is wondering, um, okay, if I can rephrase. Uh, basically, she's looking um, into how all of the CFD analysis in terms of wind direction and airflow were then used in order to feed back into the design. So, um, yeah, can you elaborate yeah, a bit? Very much. So most of, the, most of the CFD work, the computational fluid work that we do is related to pedestrian comfort. Um, uh, we don't... Well, that's currently, right? We don't do much on facade pressures and so forth. That's too engineering oriented for us. So the first thing we do is pedestrian comfort. Um, is, it, is it a space uh, okay to have people sit outside or walk outside or, or not? And we, there's a lot of tunneling and wind tunneling happening in cities and so forth, or funding as such. Um, so we try and orientate generatively buildings to, to break up these wind accelerations to be able to have the outside spaces more comfortable. Now, wind is one aspect. Um, the uh, solar and a whole bunch of other things is causing it as well. Um, moving on from that, uh, natural ventilation is a big topic at the moment for us, a really big topic. We're pushing it to many projects. Uh, uh, last year, uh, we did a natural ventilation case in a project in London where we did virtual simulation of wind as well as physical simulation of wind to understand the, the uh, buoyancy within the building to be able to allow natural ventilation uh, in that building. So CFD is going to that. So yeah, these things do affect our buildings, absolutely. Uh, CFD analysis, 100% uh, affect our buildings, but at the early stages, uh, right? That's very important. And when we get to a point where we're looking at details and facades and the breaking up, uh, it is too big a compute at the moment for us to run that iteratively. Um, so we're really looking at early stage, big moves uh, in, in, in current environments, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have... Um... Another question, which sure. is slightly off topic. Um, looking at all of these tools and platforms that you showed us today, both in terms of digital platforms, as well as the MR, AR, VR, all kinds of arts, um, how do designers react on those? I'm pretty sure that for most of the people that are in the room, we're quite a new generation of architects and designers, and for us, this becomes quite intuitive. Mm. Uh, but what about the older generations? Are they also kind of excited to have all these tools at their availability, or is there, um, yeah, some resistance? Older? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, good, less technologically I, prone. I, I, I bleached the Sorry. Story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, many people see it as, oh, that's cool, right? I mean, many see it as a use. Uh, um, but we see this sort of, yeah, I mean, quite a fair bit of designers actually jumping into this and saying, hey, I want to use this in the next project uh, again, right? We are having a project now in, 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 in Portugal uh, where they want to be doing it constantly through a design iterative process to use VR. Um, in 2017, 2018, 2016, when we did a lot of HoloLens stuff, um, we found that we had anybody in the room put a HoloLens on. That, that was it. We had CEOs approve uh, digital models against physical models because we changed the model and we didn't want to rebuild the, the, the mock-up and they would approve the digital version of that. Um, uh, IR is really something that goes forward. VR, I've been in meetings with young and old in a boardroom, uh, planning people and so forth, but I'm the only one with the VR headset on. Right? And I feel that that is still a constraint. Uh, that is something that uh, a lot of people just don't do. Many people still get motion sickness as well. Right? And I, I, I truly believe, I truly believe that, that as soon as we have a breakthrough, maybe Apple or, 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 
or Enreal where their glasses can come forward with more uh, commercial kind of glasses, commercial looking glasses with better field of views and better render quality, um, we'll see a different application. Companies like Vario, for example, I mean, they do some really interesting stuff with their high definition uh, screens and their pass through cameras. Uh, it is quite, it's quite incredible what they do. Um, but uh, I think, I think AR is the thing that people, most people latch onto. Then the other thing as well, that people do not want to put headsets on, and we're very conscious in this time that we live as well, is that take an iPad and, and look at it through a window, right? Uh, we have big screens as well. Can we project one-to-one -one on the other side of the screen as, is, as if you are a pedestrian looking at it, right? And we also very much so, we've used this last year and we're proposing it on more projects now as well, using cave environments. And I see a big use of cave environments. So people don't have to have headsets on it, but they are immersed and they're standing next to each other. So there's an understanding of physicality as well as this virtual uh, surrounding that they have with what they do. And uh, those are quite prominently used on many of our or on transport projects because it needs to be seen from the uh, pedestrian's point of view, the, the occupant, right? Can they see the wayfinding? Can they understand where the toilets are, the immigration desks, whatever the case might be. Um, but uh, it, it's a mix. It's not, it's not just an HMD, not, not, just not an Oculus that you put on, for example. Um, interesting thing though, I must just say this, that um, one of my ex-colleagues uh, uh, made this note uh, from New York side is that before the pandemic, we would have one guy in the room with a headset on and everybody looking at the one guy. Now we had like everybody alone in the room with a headset on in a virtual environment, looking at each other in a virtual environment. It's a complete flip that happened. Uh, and I hope that that continues to progress um, because there was always the one guy in the room with a headset that everybody else goes and looks at, right? And now it was, you well, you in your bedroom in a meeting with a whole bunch of other people and they all by themselves, no one's looking at them. So all of a sudden the game changed and they, the acceptance of VR was very different because they were meeting virtually in a, in a virtual space and nobody was looking at them. So, um, but there, there's a case for full immersion, I can tell you that. Um, I've had my heart rate go from 50 to 150 in seconds. Uh, there's, a, there's a case for full immersion out there, but yeah, I think, I think AR is, or, or a mixed reality is the way forward. You, you can just shout, I can repeat. No? There okay. we go. Uh, thank you for the amazing lecture. I was uh, just wondering if you have any thoughts of uh, the time frame it would take for to reach that form factor uh, fit for mass adoption when it comes to AR technology. And also I wanted to ask you how many architects, if you're comfortable with sharing this information, how many architects are involved with KPF? So you might need to rephrase that. I couldn't. Okay. First question as well. Okay. First question was: uh, Do you have any thoughts on the time frame it would take to, to reach uh, the form factor fit for mass adoption when it comes to AR technology? And second one is: How many architects or computational designers are uh, are involved with KPF? Okay. Good. So yeah. So so the time frame for that. Um, it's a guesstimate, I can guess. Uh, I think uh, probably within three to five years. Uh, it's very much technology dependent. We see, um, we do rely on streaming. I can tell you now for the scale of projects that we do, we're gonna rely on streaming. Uh, and it's only recent that 5G is coming across uh, uh, more and more cities and we need 5G as a minimum. Um, I work quite closely with some of the companies that develop some of these streaming technologies. Uh, as I said, I was gonna go onto a factory uh, yesterday, uh, but I couldn't do that yesterday because of, of, of travels and so forth, uh, where they already implemented this. There's a company in the UK we work with, and that is the sole purpose, is to stream to augmented reality. Um, but for it to become a use in a tool, uh, in, in, a, in a practice, I think probably two to three years, I would guess. I would hope not longer than that. Um, so, um, you know, and, and if we can do that, we can, we can, we can augment that, we can change the, the content that streams live in real time. Um, and the second question regarding the amount of computational people, um, less than you think. Uh, yeah, the, less than you think. This, and this is, this is the challenge, and this is why we do what we do. Um, many designers learn something like a grasshopper, for example, because they, they get taught that this is the script, we have a script library, Somebody goes to them and say, this is your, your vertical sky component script, for example, right? And this is where you need to add this geometry and this geometry. 
the, the designer needs to understand the result of the analysis. And we want them to do the analysis so they don't have to wait for anybody else to change their design, right? But if that's the only purpose. Their purpose is to affect their design. They couldn't, in many cases, care about the function of the script. They know that the script is doing vertical sky analysis. They trust that the script is running correctly. They're not interested in how the script works. They're not interested in, in, in getting better at using the script. They are interested in being able to take their massing model within a context and say, this version here is better than that version because the metrics are reading out and I'm changing my design. It's the design interface that they're using. It's not the script interface. And this is why we're building simpler interfaces now for people so that more people can use that because still to this date, many people will not open Grasshopper, right? Now to answer you, to give you a number, um, I would probably say 25 to 35% people will open Grasshopper. Less than them can actually do a script from scratch. And that's Grasshopper, right? That's node-based connectivity. It's not coding Python or C Sharp or anything like that. Um, uh, probably, probably a third of our office will probably use it. We, we are running uh, surveys quite a lot to understand. We are training people. And, uh, there's many training sessions happening the whole time. Uh, we're onboarding people. Every time there's a simple, or relatively simple analysis like daylight or, or overshadowing or vertical sky running, we teach someone to do that. Um, but in many cases, if that person's main drive is design, which many designers main drive is, they will forget what we taught them in the next project, right? Um, because they are interested in design. Now, now what we try and do here is get a tool palette for them and say, hey, what, what do you want to do? Vertical sky component, where's your massing? Here it is, right? Now, can I run this iteratively? Can I just model? and understand automatically what's happening. So, so um, I, I, it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I'd say there's a fair bit of people that did it in the past, but they, they're dropping it because they're focusing more on design. It's, it, design is really the, 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 the core of this. The, the, this is what we're, where I'm kind of coming from, this human aspect of, of creating beautiful spaces that's built, that's static, that stands there when it's done. Now we're trying to do it as best as we can with tools, with scripting tools and other, other tools and so forth. And, We'd really try and democratize that to as many people as possible. But yeah, I would say, I mean, yeah, 30, 40%. I, I, I wouldn't say more than that. But taken, many, many architects become project managers as well and technical architects, um, you know, uh, which is very important. It's very important in our practice, uh, technical art, architects and, and the likes. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Kovos. I, I think. I mean, I, I would like to sum up with um, maybe saying that although it is true that you are having, uh, well, first of all, it's great to see somebody coming from um, uh, a very significant practice to experiment with, uh, with um, these technologies. Um, I also think that uh, although you are doing a hard job to try to create these interfaces, that some of these processes could be democratized into more designers or other stakeholders, I think that we are also like, um, um, there's a lot of work um, still to be done. One of the, of the main and important works is to educate um, professionals to understand design in a different way, um, to expand their skills and the tools um, that they will need for that. Um, but I also, I also just want to highlight that um, it's necessary also to have critical, um, let's say, thinking um, and, and a critical approach to that so that um, uh, it doesn't become the experimentation of the sake of the experimentation, yeah. but it yeah. really becomes, right. you know, the medium yeah. of, of getting um, um, into um, wider and bigger objectives. So... Uh, that was um, uh, a fantastic uh, class, <laughs> Kovus. Thank you for setting this with us. Um, thank you for joining us um, here at IAC and also um, a huge thanks to the people that they are connected online. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.